Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to Run to the Hills, episode 96. Podcast sponsored by Cheer Charge. Cheer Charge have been fueling adventures with real food made with real ingredients since 2012. Go and check them out at www.cheercharge.co.uk. You can even snap up a Run to the Hills podcast buff, yeah, just yeah. like Gary from the podcast wears. <laughs> Oh, hey. <laughs> Gary from the podcast has had terrible technical issues this morning. Oh, well, if anyone's watching on YouTube, um, I'm not sure if the audio is going to be any worse, but if anyone's watching on YouTube, I've got my earphones in and I'm on an iPhone. Quite stressful today, Eddie. Um, or if I'm every... really loud and you're really quiet and people keep turning up and then every time I talk, they probably have to do that anyway normally, don't they? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, quite stressful start of the day, which wasn't good. I thought everything was fine. Then I went in the the studio and um re the realize studio. that this is <laughs> the garage basically <laughs> i realized i left my camera and everything in the car so um hopefully my car doesn't get broken into in durham today you did then so, say yeah. you've got cameras littered all over the house which made me laugh uh, as well every camera there's, go there's gopros there's insta 360s and none of them could do it but now we are on the iphone so hopefully it's okay sessions wise i did my two sessions um the 15 that was it the 15 minutes and the five times one key and then the 15 minutes too and that was really good i i think i said last week i was going to do it on the flats and it never happened so i ended up just running on the trails but the effort was definitely the effort was there and i you know we talked i think it was Adley Dobson when we asked asked him about his mindset and for me, that was an enormous session, 15 minutes, and then done five times one here, and another 15 minutes. That's a big session. And now that's done, next time a similar session comes along and I don't fancy it, you can always draw on, well, I did that. You know, that, that, that I, I can do these sessions. So that's definitely in the bank mentally for the future. So, yeah, enjoyed that. And then did all my strength and conditioning and still going with the hamstring stuff. 80 miles of running a lot of walking too so i think i probably all in all over 90 miles um about 9,000 feet of elevation and what did you do you know ended the week on two big um runs must have been 15 and 18 mile runs on saturday and sunday and i was super mindful to keep my um, efforts at this kind of 130 beats 135 beats a minute i didn't want to exceed that and then just see how that translated into pace so i'm really yeah, really trying to hone in on what that effort should be for Lake 100. And these trails aren't the same as the Lake District trails, so it's not really a fair representation. But I'm hopefully do that again. Do, do every long run now, do that. Um, keep my effort super duper low because it's so easy, you know. When we did Down Dales, we went blasting off like 145 beats a minute. And then before at the end, you know, we probably struggled to do 120 beats a minute. So, and I did look, I'm going super detailed in my previous Lake 100. And I was like doing a threshold run for the first probably <laughs> seven or eight miles. Everyone does a threshold run out of Coniston, don't they, up the hill? Well, I probably still will to get through the gate. I know there's a bit of a bottleneck, isn't there? So I probably will still do that until then. But yeah, it was threshold. The heart rate was like in the 150s at some point, which was insane to the latter stage of the races. Uh, the race, the heart rate was so low, the overall average heart rate went down to about 110, 115 beats a minute. So I definitely didn't distribute the pace evenly all through all the, the race. Field, maybe. Are you well, wearing you. your full Lakeland pack in these long runs now? Uh, probably not a full pack, no. But um, get it yeah, on, def Gary. Get it on. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to you know fueling up every. I think I'm going to go down to 25 minutes for fuel. Um, but yeah, again, go again this weekend at that um, 130 beats a minute and two big days and see yeah i think that's probably a wise thing to do just to hone in on that effort and it'll be really a good test of the ego maybe that first mile to get through the gate at coniston but after that if you can just go we're walking now that is probably that for last week apart from a really stressful start to tuesday how about you made any um civil servants cry this week how are we doing Oh my God, Bryn has taken the mantle of the... Ooh. He just sent me a message, literally as you're talking, saying, the woman at the consulate said, I can see you've rung many times. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> oh, Gary, nobody's helped me. You all listen to the podcast and send me helpful messages. Nobody's helped me. <laughs> I think we're going to have to cancel our holidays. I told them oh last night and there was a degree of door slamming and crying. And I said, look, we can't, there's nothing we can do. My God. My God. My God. So oh, I don't know what to do, Gary. It's, to, it's take care of my life because. Um, oh, I had a stressful morning. This sounds terrible. It was stressful. I'm like, Bryn, you have to tell the people that we're not coming. Um, but it's everything because we're not. Um, it's all the other details. We've got house sitters, we've got flights, we've booked the car yeah. from the airport, we've got the hire car on the other side, we've got everything, like so many things booked and um, and paid for. Um, wow. so, I don't know. Yeah, they, they said, oh, wait. The concept said, wait, we'll book you. But it's like, well, by the time this goes out, it'll be Friday. You, can't, yeah. and then you have to make a call at some point because we've said to the kids, we'll go away, but we just can't leave France. <laughs> Hello, Lindy. Lindy's ready. Hello, hello. Um, but, but it's just like it's such a disappointment because we've been in France for like three years consistently now. I don't really, I don't really want to pay a lot of money to go on holiday in France. I know that sounds really spoiled, but um, but we're going to have to because we've. <laughs> I don't I often am very happy to disappoint the kids and very it's very easy for me to say no but this has been like and Bryn's really looking forward to it because he works for Bryn was looking forward to it yeah so we're looking forward to it so we're gonna have to throw some big dollars at this problem Gary and put it on the old MasterCard and sort it out later anyway it doesn't matter it's just taken over my life for last week yeah. I did buy some cream because I yesterday in Capital so I was like <laughs> right I need to I hope because I haven't bought anything not that we really need anything and I'm always was really mindful of that now that I don't we don't really need anything to, uh, it's quite nice to have something new for a holiday but I don't really need it I've got this old yeah. bikini that I've been wearing for the past 20 years it's fine just put that on um but I did buy sun creams we'll use them anyway and so that's all I've got I've got a bag of sun creams your yeah, bikini's not perish Lisa's um I think it might be chlorine in the pools but they... I think it's chlorine but we don't, I don't swim in the pool because we've got the lakes here a great um yeah it's probably just so thick and <laughs> probably as parents is probably indecent um anyway so the passport drama continues the running drama so i went to the gym on friday and i did some squats gary i can't remember even what i did what was it three lots of five sets or something like that anyway squatted quite heavy gary came out of the gym couldn't walk up the steps i couldn't bend my knee <gasps> i don't know what i did <laughs> probably squatted too heavy if i was not i'm not a genius to that anyway my knee ballooned to the size of a small country i joke you not <sighs> by the end of the day i was dragging it behind me i couldn't bend it it was so bad what, you know what that was your weeks are much more entertaining than mine <laughs> <laughs> so i ended up like dragging it around all weekend and we had a really busy weekend the kids did their like end of um two of my kids are very dramatic and love doing um this theater club <laughs> where they get that from and um so they had these shows which were love which was hilarious um i'm brilliant at the same time so i was really really busy getting them up and down to that and doing all that sort of stuff hair makeup costumes and that's just for finley he was like mom i'm so close to putting mascara on <laughs> Ooh. I was like, okay no dude we don't you don't need that anyway he's super cool he did this super cool rap what a dude he's awesome. uh he's uh it's probably a bit of overshare about the kids but he's in this group there's there's it must be about 40 kids and there's three boys um, and he owns it. He owns it. He loves it. I'm like, just stay in that. You're going to, in three or four years, you're going to love that vibe if you stay in yeah. there. Too. But I love the fact that he's like, I don't, he's not interested. He doesn't care how many boys there are. He's a super cool dude. But he's oh, that's good. Boys. Confident. Yeah, he's, he can get on the stage. He get he got hold of the mic and off he goes. <laughs> you almost have to take it off him. <laughs> like, all right. Anyway, uh, so I dragged. I was like, oh my god, like okay. I iced the knee. I was putting my chair. I was like, I cannot believe this. Anyway, went so I was like, I can't run. Wanted to go on my bike. Try and it felt okay to go on my bike. Anyway, did this swift race on the front. I think this was maybe this was it. Looking back now, <laughs> did this swift race on Friday, which was an hour long. It was intense, Gary. It was intense, and I didn't move. I don't think for an hour on the saddle. This is going to be complete overshare. 
but people are going to love it. Love <laughs> I don't think I moved off the saddle for like an hour and I pushed really hard. Um, and I got the most terrible saddle sore on my bum. It's so sore, Gary, that at the moment, <laughs> while I'm talking to you, I'm sitting on like a towel. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, I don't know what I've done. And so I'd like, Google, after all the, I spent years in cycling, never got yeah. a jaffing occasionally, but never got a saddle sore. Anyway, I had to do, Bryn and I did some extensive <laughs> interrogation. I was like, what the hell? Oh my goodness. Happened, <laughs> what the, so not only did I have this really sore knee, I've got this gammy butt that I'm like, oh my gammy God. Gammy butt. No, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful oh my god what a weekend anyway oh. the, tea link, the knee's fine i went to my physical therapist on monday she's like it's just got the it pants got really tight not surprised with the achilles blah blah blah. she gave me some good um treatment and she's giving me these um i need to go and pick them up today actually these um they're like complex where you stimulate the muscle to work okay yeah I need to do a little bit of that. It's all fine. I'm running again. It's fine. But the... Do you roll your IT band? Is that so, part of your... Yeah, I need to roll my IT band. So I've been going with my Theragun. All sorts of stuff. I've spent so much time on the other leg. I've neglected the other leg. <sighs> anyway, I would sit on my bike. She was like, so you can bike and you can swim. And I just couldn't tell her. I was like, you, I can't tell you that my undercarriage is destroyed. <laughs> and too much swift racing. So I was like, uh -huh. yeah, thinking, oh my God, I can't swim. I'm like... Anyway, it's not so many. I must admit, for like crikey, what four or five months, you've just been battered from all over. <laughs> I feel I've been battered. This one, this is so unfair. Uh, anyway, it's real life, isn't it? It's real life when you're busy and you perhaps neglect yourself a little bit. So, anyway, hopefully, you'll see on Strava when it's better and I can get back on. <laughs> So I'm too scared to go in a pool, too scared to sit on my bike, but I've been, I treated myself this morning, last, yesterday I treated myself and I did a, my favourite little trail, which is ridiculous, with a sore knee, really technical little trail run that I love, I'm like, this is why, you do. I love it, and the dogs, the dogs, the dogs were so naughty, they got, they started chasing this, um, like, alpine squirrel, and oh, wow. they're like the size of, like, a cat, Anyway, this out, they would start going for this alpine squirrel. And I was like, no, no, stop it, leave it. They wouldn't leave it. Anyway, the squirrel turned around. It was like right under my feet. The squirrel turned around and just went for the dogs. And I was like, yeah, enough, hey, enough. No, you go. <laughs> so aggressive. Um, and anyway, eventually got up a tree. Um, so I have, yeah, I did a way too technical uh, run to try the knee out, but it was fine. And then this morning I treated myself to a bit of road running. I put on the old comfy road trainers and some tunes and I ran I dropped the kids at school and I was like do you know what I'm just gonna run five miles on the road then I don't need to because all the all the running around here you have to be quite mindful all the time that you don't kill yourself falling over yeah so I was like do you know what I'm just gonna run on the road and listen to some tunes ran up and they'd closed the road because they're retarmacking everything still for the Tour de France so there was no cars on it so I had this beautiful oh, grid. I love that. fresh tarmac yeah. I was like how wet <laughs> tarmac am i gonna end up getting stuck in it? <laughs> um but it, and so i just chugged along listening to a bit of uh oh, what's my tune of jack savaretti have you heard of jack savaretti uh, no, no it's probably a bit teenage for you gary but listening to that so they'll be watching glastonbury oh we watched a little bit with my dramatic son he loved it i think he was like I can see where I'm heading now. Yeah, I enjoy that. He's in the cupboard. <gasps> Loved it. Would you would you go to Glastonbury now as a clean athlete? <laughs> <laughs> it's a clean athlete. Um, yeah, would well, you know, Lisa and I talked about it. Quite... <clears throat> yeah, oh my goodness, George would absolutely oh, love it. He... Love it. Yeah. And and Esme would love it too, but she'd wave goodbye to us at the gate and then we'd see her on Sunday night. <laughs> yeah. But I've been, you know, art students, um, three times I think I've been to Glastonbury and some very colourful experiences. Um, leave it at that, space cakes and I think LSD. That's about as much as I'll share. <laughs> One and only time I was like, that's the first and last time I'd uh, tried it. But uh, yeah, it was awesome. You know, I can't even think of bands. It was like the Pretenders, like these epic bands and then some Kings of Leon before they were even famous when they were cool. Stuff like that. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Radiohead. Yeah, I would definitely go again, but a £1,200 for a family of four for a long weekend. Maybe not for a little while. 
Do you think you'd uh, take everybody there? Oh, I'd love to. We, do you know, we used to live near Glastonbury for a short while, and my, but my mum and dad used to go and sell eggs for the farmer for breakfast. Back, this oh. is, this must be 30 years ago, when they didn't have the fence, and you could just, like, wander around and ah. to hear it from the garden. Yeah, I would like to go, but it's people like you, Gary, that put me off, really, because I see <laughs> the audience pictures, and I think... <laughs> I'll be there with vapor flies and that. <laughs> I surrounded by things like that. Not sure. Yeah, I'm sure there's lots of other other concerts and stuff like that you could go to, which would be a little bit cheaper. But I'd love uh, to see. It's not. A, it's not a nice thing to see, but I'd be curious of the carnage. It's basically what people leave behind in the tents and stuff like that. I, I think it's so wasteful. And I don't know about this year, but I think previously other festivals at least, it's not been a good sight after the event. Glastonbury, but with a bit of running in it, in it involved as well. <sighs> You yeah. have trail running in the day and then you have a concert in the evening and you're heavily yeah. tested by that. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't imagine doing anything like that anymore now. Like even a couple of drinks I'm stressing about the next day. So <laughs> <clears throat> some mind-altering drugs would be uh, way off the, li off the uh, list. While I was dragging my knee and butt around, what was happening? Big races we were following. You know, I can't believe we didn't give it a shout out for upcoming races last week. Well, you know, uh, there were really big races in the UK. <laughs> what did we shout out? <laughs> That's true. But oh my goodness, I, I just they do such a good job too with um, the way they kind of put it across. And I think now they do the live streaming. It's just an awesome event. And my, the thing oh, yeah, about live streaming, though, Gary, that gets to me, it's the same with like the Marathon de Mont Blanc. The live streaming on that is like the people in the lead have a camera on them and yeah. right next to them the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wonder how much you zone that out, but also how, like, it sort of takes away the, like, being out there. Being on your own, yeah, being out there. I wonder, yeah, is it just, because <clears throat> I never watch loads of it, but is it just in and out of checkpoints or would there be someone just pop up in the middle of nowhere with a Well, with a the, I didn't watch any of the Western States live feed. I just followed it on the app. But the Golden Series, I watched the Marathon de Mont Blanc live and they are, they literally have a bike or a runner, the runners don't last very long, um, <laughs> on the males the whole time, the whole time. Yeah. Um, so it must be like, I <clears throat> wonder if that's quite off-putting. You've got a bike yeah. behind you. <laughs> but you've got to be super fast. You say about the runners don't last long. You have to be super fast. If you look at, say, Ruth Crop's time of 17 hours and 21 minutes, I couldn't, even for 200 metres, I'd probably struggle at that pace on that terrain. Well, so yeah, you, have to you be know, me and Crofty, we go back a long way and we did race oh, yes, up I remember. together. <laughs> and um, I didn't go for very long either. I did stay with her for a climb, 600 metres up climb. I stayed behind her. Hey, I'll was, take that. I was, I'll was. i take that, but I do think she was like chatting. <laughs> we'll leave that. We'll leave that. Uh, give us it was a good win for Ruth because she, I think she was second last year behind Beth uh, Pascal. And this year she, yeah, she won in 17.21. Still not beating Beth's time of 17. Uh, I was in 10 minutes, but I wonder if they were both racing together. If that would have, you know, got Ruth's time down a bit, having someone to chase or or um, be running scared from. But yeah, super fast time. Well done, Ruth. And for the guys, poker athlete Adam Peterson, 15 hours and 13 minutes. And again, I just mind boggling speeds, but he was still quite way off Jim Walsey record time, 14 hours and nine minutes. Um, Jim is, Jim's over in Europe at the moment, isn't he? Getting ready for UTMB, is that correct? Yeah, I think so. So I've heard, don't really follow him on social media, yeah. but I've heard that's what he's doing. So well done, um, preparing to come second to Killian. <laughs> we can never come on the show talking like that. Jim, Jim or Killian. They're always asking, but we just haven't kind of slotted them in yet. Right, the spine. Oh, loads and loads of races. Loads and loads of course records broken, but we're just going to win out. The spine winners. Anna Troops that broke her own summer course record. Yeah. 78 hours, 57 minutes, 49 seconds. And Tian Erwi won the Melbourne's race in 70 hours, 46 minutes, 50 <clears throat> seconds. Now, they both must have had about 20 minutes sleep, I think. Not a regular sleep in that record-breaking. Uh, I'm just listening to a podcast, actually. It's huge well done before I start talking about myself again. Huge well done. Anyone that did spine, any of the spine races, uh, cute I loved it. Loved it. Loved following them. Uh, I'm just listening to a podcast, Coop Cast podcast, which I know you like, Gary. Yeah, I've listened to it. Choose, I can choose, but I'm listening to the one on sleep deprivation. And they actually did the study on spine athletes. Yeah. 
Well, again, we would talk, we'll talk about this with Carl, who's coming up to talk about it. They studied athletes that are not... It's hard with who you get to offer to do these um, uh, uh, research projects, isn't it? Because <clears throat> the elite end of the field didn't obviously don't really want to be involved in that project because they're focused on the race. So yeah. they did study sort of middle-of-the-pack um, runners, which is going to differ in the sleep, what they find about sleep. But it's really interesting chat if you haven't listened to it yet and you're going into a race, uh, which might have what one night, two night, three nights, and it's all about how you plan your did he say the the, the, the people he studied for the Tour de Jones, one guy had only ran 15 miles. That was his longest run or something. That's what he said. And it's also quite interesting is that he said nobody slept for the first night. Yeah. And whether that actually is a good strategy um, is yet to be found. That'd be quite an interesting study. I mean, you'd actually, actually have to... Um, uh, you'd have to actually set something up, wouldn't you? And have two sets and have two races <laughs> and not let the first night sleep, but the first and let the other race let them sleep for a couple of hours and see the difference yeah. it makes. Really interesting as I'm plan starting to plan like. Yeah, months. the caffeine too. I thought that was super interesting. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting. I'm based, my sleep plan is basically I'm not going to sleep until I literally. Somebody says you need to go. To <laughs> I yeah. think the first, the, the, the first the third night. Was it the first night sleep was basically it was just super duper busy. So people, mm. Mm. it wasn't a suitable place to stop and sleep, even if you were tired, really. I think that was some a takeaway from it. But yeah, like, you know, Anna True did it several times. <clears throat> I imagine every time she comes away with a little bit of nuggets that she will or won't do again the next she, time i did just read her on social i wanted to send her a message saying can you give us a little sound bite for the podcast but i didn't want to disturb her but i did just read on social media that she said she was very confused over the cheviots of what she was actually doing there and did she actually <laughs> have to follow her garmin line and she rang Richard to say what why am i following this line so i think definitely the sleep deprivation um is going to kick in anyway if you haven't listened to that podcast go and find it we digress slightly there but leading into about research, who we got this week? Super nice guy. He was great, actually. Uh, really nice to chat with Carl. And I like these interviews where they do just end up being a bit of a chit chat. And that's definitely how it felt. And I hope Carl felt the same too. But yeah, Carl is from the, it was an academic one, but he's doing a, a study called the Trail Ultra Project. And this project aims to explore and document the growth of trail and ultra running in the North, in North America and in the UK. It's super interesting. And yeah, you can go and reach out and do the survey, which we discuss in the interview. We've been super lucky to be joined by Carl Morris. Now, Carl is conducting some research. In, oh, what's it? Refresh me the name, Carl. Sorry. So, the Trail Ultra Project is the Trail. short name of the title. Yeah. You've just awesome. been talking about it, Gary. I know. Well, I closed. The, I closed the window on my desktop. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! I thought it was memorable as well, sir. <laughs> we just talked about how memorable. Said, oh, what, a, what a good tagline it was. But I went like, off script. I did two things wrong. I closed the window and I went off script. <laughs> anyway, yeah. back on script. Back on script. Rewind. Where are you? What's the view from your window? And have you been for a run today? Yeah, so thanks for having me on, um, Gary and Eddie. So uh, I am in, I'm at home. I'm in Otley in West Yorkshire, uh, just north of Leeds. Um, the view of my window is okay. I've got a small fell outside my house, Otley Shevin. Very nice. <laughs> um, and I have been for a run up the Shevin. So you've caught me actually on a, a training peak. So I've been out this morning and I'm going out again this afternoon. <gasps> oh, oh dear. Look, what's, what, what's, on the, what's on the plan today? Double run. Whoa. Yeah. So just a short half hour in the morning and then two hours this afternoon. So. Oh, and is it a specific session? So I've got my first hundred miler in a couple of weeks, two and a half weeks, ultra trail Snowdonia. So oh. I'm trying to, I'm trying to teach myself to run a bit slower because yeah. <laughs> that's going to be the problem. So yeah, sort of slow, easy, but with lots of elevation. That's what I'm going to go. Have you wrecked any of the course? I haven't. No, no, I know. Uh, I've done lots of climbing in Snowdonia, but never any running, so I don't know okay. it, which you're is one of the attractions of it. Yeah, actually. you're quite comfortable on that sort of gnarly technical climbing terrain. Oh, yeah. No, that's that's what I love. Yeah, that's what, what I love. You're going to love it. Then. 
I only say that because I got a client doing it and she wrecked uh, leg five and six just over the weekend as her last like sort of training days. And I think she was, uh, yeah, she's quite comfortable on that sort of terrain as well. But I think it's going to be, it's going to be a big test because yeah. I think people are thinking, oh, it's like the UTMB of um, Britain, but like UTMB, there's no, there's, you never actually need your hands. Yeah. Is it part of this, am, I, am I correct in thinking this is part of the new UTMB uh, it is. franchise? Yeah, it's pretty much the only way to get into UTMB in the is UK. Is that your aspirations for UTMB? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So I'd love to do UTMB. Why not? You know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, well, hope, maybe by the time this is probably will go out at the same time as you'll either have just be about to do it or have just done it. So yeah, we'll... I'll be carrying me out of a ditch somewhere, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Can you share us a little bit how you got to um, where you are now? We're going to talk mainly about your research project, but we felt it was quite good to kind of paint the picture of like why you would want to do this sort of project. Tell us a little bit about your personal running journey and how you find yourself to be, I don't, do you know, to be honest, I don't even really know what a researcher is. So maybe we can talk a little bit about the running and you can tell us a little bit about the day job as well. Sure, yeah. So, um, so it's interesting, I guess, because my own running background has partly prompted the project really um, because I don't I don't come from a running background. This has come up in a lot of the interviews that I've done. Everybody says, particularly British runners, I did cross country at school once, hated it, yeah. never ran again. <laughs> um, and pretty pretty similar with me really. I do come from a, a strong kind of fell walking background. You know, it's been always a very important part of my sort of childhood and and adult years. And uh, obsessed about climbing and mountaineering really since the age of thirteen. Um, <clears throat> so I love the mountains, but 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 never never running at, at all. Uh, it's not really something I thought I would ever do. Um, you know, work, life, family, all of those kind of things took over. And again, this is something that comes up a lot into my kind of early thirties. You know, getting unfit, and I just took up running really, just to get a little bit fitter. The first and only road run I've ever done was the first run. I thought, if I'm going to continue this, I can't, I can't do this. So I started running off road um, and, and, and gradually just fell into fell running, um, but was really inspired by some of the longer stuff. Um, like Gary, I'm a bit of a Bob Graham obsessive. Um, and, you know, that was kind of an aspiration early on, really. I just kind of really fascinated by that longer mountainous kind of running um and it's evolved from that you know sort of into ultras and you know sort of aspiring for multi-day efforts all of that kind of thing really um so running is a really important part of my everyday life now i mean i've totally embraced it in every single aspect of everything yeah. that i do in, in, in terms of my day job i mean I, i'm um, i'm an academic i'm a sociologist i've been at a, a few universities um i'm at the university of central lancashire now um, because I'm a sociologist, I kind of work in the humanities, uh, that gives me a lot of freedom to look at whatever interests me, really. There's not huge amounts of money in that area of research. Um, and if there's, no, if there's no money, there's nobody telling you what to do, which is yeah. the good thing. So, so um, I've, I had a big project, which I finished last year, on something completely unrelated, really, uh, around media and religion. Um, I've got a book coming out in that area and I wanted something completely new, something fresh, something I could really get into. And, and, and I thought I'm going to combine my two passions, really, work and running and, and, and do a project on that. I don't know how it works, but you have to pitch an idea for funding and then it's a yes or no. Yeah. So if you, if you want research, so there's, there's two types of research funding, the university has its own funding and they basically give me time to go away and do research and, and small amounts of money for that research. If you want to have a bigger project where you maybe hire research assistants, people to work for you, yeah. that kind of project, um, <clears throat> you need to pitch an idea to a funding body. It's really competitive, really difficult to get money like that. Um, and you have to align yourself with whatever the funding body might want. Yeah, yeah um, it can't, yeah. Do you have anybody working for you? Is this per purely you driving this project? No, so I've got colleagues that I work with at the Center for Applied Sport at the university, uh, and some of my colleagues are doing research on running. So we're kind of, you know, <laughs> sort of doing parallel projects and sort of feeding off each other, that kind of thing. Um, no, I don't have anyone working for me. That would be, be nice in a way, but at the same time, do I do like research because I like to do it you know i like to go out and do it so i don't want to pay someone to do it for me um so do you lecture at the university as well 
Yeah, so a large part of my job is is, is teaching uh, during the autumn and the spring and March. How has that autumn. looked over the last, I'm thinking you're very professional on Zoom, how's that looked over the last couple of years? <laughs> a lot of students asleep on Zoom, not saying your lectures are boring. <laughs> well, they don't turn the camera on, so I don't know if they're asleep or not, oh, yes. which is, yeah, I know. Um, That's hard, eh? That must be really hard. Yeah, but at the same time, I've not insisted on that either because I, I think some of them are at home going through some difficult times. The thing that we've really struggled with is the personal crises that students are going through. Yeah. Uh, lots of mental health issues, um, you know, people just really needing a lot of support. We've had to be quite flexible, I think. And I know that's, that's widespread, actually. Um, students feeling quite isolated and alienated and not having all of that on campus no. interaction. Because yeah. really, we all know we go to uni for the social and that sort of growing up, that huge growing up transition from leaving home and like learning to be an adult, even though you're not really mm. as still a child, but then not to have that. And then, but then having to like learn how to work in a lecture environment, but without like any, it must be, it must be really hard for you as well. But now is it sort of back, students back, you're back in the lecture halls, what are they called? The lecture theatres? Yeah, yeah, we are. So we're back, we've been on campus this year, which has been great. Um, but there's still a lot of that legacy. I think students who were struggling during COVID yeah, they've are not still struggling, really. So I think, yeah. and I think we're getting school leavers now who, again, have had a bit of a strange, you know, time at school towards the end of their A-levels, all of that kind of thing, really. So there's a legacy, I think, that's going to be going on for a while now. I worry about some of the really uh, young children who have missed, uh, you know, a few years of that kind of social skills that they would have got maybe at some kind of preschool situation but yeah my oldest my daughter my oldest child she's doing her GCSEs uh now so yeah it's been quite an interesting two two and a bit years yeah it's a, quite a wild time for them curious where you're at with your Bob Graham round journey though Carl yeah that was oh. <laughs> sorry to so, squeeze uh, <laughs> I don't know how many attempts I've had because um I don't know whether they counted as real attempts or not so Maybe three. Um, I was always motivated by doing it solo. I was oh, really wanting to do it by myself. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I supported a friend on his Bob Graham about a week and a half ago, actually. And it was amazing. I mean, the energy, all the people there at Honister for him. Yeah. Um, it was really special and it was really nice to be with him on that journey. But I've always really quite fancied the idea of just being by myself, self-supported, yeah. solo in the mountains. So <laughs> I kind of tried it three times. I don't know. The first time was a recce. I did it. You know, I know you like the details, Gary. So <laughs> I did it. I did it anti-clockwise, starting at nine in the morning, which is really weird and unusual. Yeah. Um, and probably a mistake. I, I did legs five, four, and three because I was doing it backwards. Yeah, this is two years ago. Uh, really good time. I got around in twelve hours to Dunmail, so two thirds. That's good. Around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I didn't feel too bad, but then I was going up onto that final bit, and it was night time. It was ten o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night. Okay. Um, and just the idea, I'd never run by myself in the dark for an extended yeah. period. Um, and I don't know, just the enormity of doing that at that point. And I hadn't brought any gloves. It was the middle of summer. I didn't think I was going to get cold. But you do, oh, don't you? You start to get yeah. cold, yeah. You really do. <laughs> um, so I just thought, I'll treat that as a recce. I'll drop out. That's fine. Um, I came back a few months later in September. Shouldn't have started. The weather was atrocious. Um, I'm always the optimist. I looked at the weather report and thought, it's going to be better than it says it's going to be better. And yeah. it wasn't, it was far worse. So, the lakes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I did, I did the first two legs in torrential rain, in the dark, oh. by myself, <laughs> oh. about 10 hours. And I got around to uh, Dunmail and thought, right, you know, that... Uh, that, that, that was that was just a recce, you know. Yes, I love yeah. this. I love this. this new, I'm going to use this mantra a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but I came back last year, and I really was going to go for it this time. I actually got a tracker so that people could follow what I was doing, and I sort okay. of shared it with my family and friends. And you know, I'm going for it this time. I've got got enough experience now. I got all the way around. I did four legs. I did it clockwise. I got all the way around to Honister. Yeah, um, it just taken me a little bit longer than I'd expect. The weather hadn't been brilliant for the first part. I got around yeah. in about 20 hours to Honister. And I don't know, I did that classic thing, I think, you know, in your mind, you start to rationalise dropping out. And it was Ooh. it was kind of like, it's probably going to be a da bit dangerous scrambling down Robinson. My yeah. legs are gone. You know, it's all greasy now. It's actually really, really claggy. You can't see yeah. anything. It's dark. And I've got what I wanted. I've got a 20-hour day in the mountains. Who cares? I'm not going to be in the club anyway because it's a solo thing. Yeah. So I, I dropped out of Honister, you know, kind of quite happy with the decision for about 10 minutes. And then... <laughs> I was going to say that, yeah. If you only for until you get in the car and then it's like, yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah. So I'll be back. I will go back. I was going to go back this May, but I broke my toe in March and then yeah. I had COVID. 
and it just didn't seem sensible to no. try and squeeze it in. It sounds like, Carl, what you need about when you sort of getting leg five-ish, you just need Gary to pop up and give you some words of... <laughs> words of wisdom with a cheer charge bar some yeah. calories a hot cup of tea and be like mate you're all right you can do this you're safe and then maybe just follow for like half an hour at a safe distance and then it's not pure then though is it eddie oh, i love it yeah I, it's so it's super tough because uh, you know there's moments i was quite fortunate on the successful one i never had many laws yeah but you had like a thousand people getting exactly yeah there well. was like it was like forrest gump at some point so it was pretty embarrassing but <laughs> that sometimes yeah that distraction is just enough to keep you going on but I, I i'm like yourself i really want to do a solo round but I, thankfully now i can do that because i've done it once um like a, a proper bob or, or a supported bob or a, uh, a confirmed bob graham round sorry um so yeah i do fancy a solo bob but yeah it, it's really tricky because you've just got nobody just to offer you a little bit of wisdom or a bit of motivation just when you need it but oh uh, my goodness me fingers crossed yeah <laughs> <laughs> should we move on shall we um right i'm gonna get it the trail ultra project I'd love to know more about the project. Sure. So I'll tell you the, I suppose, the inspiration for the project, because that's quite relevant, really. Um, as I've said, I was going to, I wanted to do something on running. I wanted to combine my academic and personal interests. I was going to do something very specific on media and running, um, because that's kind of in my wheelhouse, really. Um, and I started doing the background research for the project. Um, and it was just really quite apparent there's almost nothing that has been written by academics about trail and ultra running from a kind of cultural and sociological perspective. Um, all the research out there is has been done by sports psychologists and physiologists and nutritionists and all of that kind of performance-based research. Mm. I mean, there's a, there's a ton of that out there um, and I'm sure it's all really valuable. Oh, yeah, yeah. Loads of it on men, all of yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, David Roche goes on about that a lot, actually, you know, the uh, the sports coach, yeah, about the lack of research on women and the need for that. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of stuff I have no, no clue about anyway, really. Um, but the kind of softer, human-centered, sort of historical, sociological stuff, there was just nothing out there, really. So this idea to do a smaller, very specific project quickly gathered steam, and I thought, I'm just going to do something a bit more um, ambitious, actually, really. Um, and the other thing that really kind of caught my attention was the, I started looking at the statistics for the growth of the sport. I had to put together a load of race statistics for race finishes. Um, for okay, yeah, because we were wondering where these were these stats on race finishes, how, where were they from? That's mm. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an ultramarathon website, um, DUV, it's a German website, yeah, yeah. which yeah. And Andy Milroy, the sports historian, um, has been helping them compile uh results um you can't compile them on the website so i went through and i got all of the race results for the trail and ultra races put them on a spreadsheet crunch the numbers did all of that kind of thing from the sort of 1980s onwards for both for both the united states and for the uk um and i was able to put together then you know a sense of the growth of the sport so Did i read that right though was it like 1800 percent for uk growth 1,800%, yeah. So that was between 2009 and 2019 because then we had a, a slump because of COVID. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so there were 18 times, 18 times the number of finishes in 2019 compared to 2009 in the UK, um, which makes it one of the fastest growing sports, right? You know, yeah, yeah. massive. You know, you, you, um, I think it's 30,000 race finishes, I think, something like that, 33,000 race finishes in the UK. So uh, I don't know what that would have meant back in 2009, but not very many. <laughs> it's still tiny, though, to keep it in perspective. You think one mass participation road race, similar like the Great North Run, just in one event, you've got 30,000 plus finishes. So it is still quite, it sounds enormous when you think of that percent, but yes, mm. it's quite small. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Compared to road running. Yeah, it's absolutely tiny. Um, but you, you, you just know that there is something in the growth of the sport when all of these big shoe and apparel companies are suddenly releasing a range of trail running shoes and all of that kind of thing and really trying to yeah, promote yeah. it. So, um, so but, you know, the, the sport's growing quite quickly and um, nobody's documenting it really. Um, you know, I mean, people are doing incredible work kind of in terms of community history and 
uh, kind of media production, you know, podcasts like this and, you know, uh, a lot of the kind of websites, they're doing great work, but nobody's kind of putting this together in a slightly more formalized way, I guess, really, or documenting it from an academic perspective, yeah. spending a real amount of time. on So that's that's what I wanted to do. I, I thought, you know, OK, you know, nobody's doing it. I could I could do this. Right. <laughs> Hit on it. This is it. Hit the jackpot. You talk about the 800, but then also in the US, a massive growth but only, only, seems crazy, only 300%. Um, have you found, or have got an opinion, what, what, what the difference is? Why there's such a percentage-wise huge growth in the UK compared to the US? Mm, I don't know. The US started at a slightly higher level. Uh, oh, there's been yeah. more of a tradition of, of ultra running in the US than there has in the UK, which is really interesting. Our races have tended to be shorter. Um, whereas the US, uh, they got, to... because we haven't got so far to run, it's and that's much smaller <laughs> island. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think they have a lot of caps, don't they? Land on they got compared to us. I know we had both uh, and Dan on last week, and we talked about um, land on, land ownership. But I think there is real issues in the states with uh, people accessing land, so maybe that is a reason why. Yeah, th th there is there is there is a problem with land ownership. Yeah, oh, there's a problem here as well. I mean, there's increasingly a problem here. Um, I mean, Boff and Dan's discussion with you is really interesting because land ownership and access is a problem here. So let's can we break the project down now? So we've got your sort of um, your why of why you wanted to do it, your history and the running, and now can you just go into a little bit more detail about the nitty gritty of the project. Um, yeah. And we should say right from right from the off now, we're going to ask all our listeners to participate in the survey for you for your project. So. Sell it to them, tell them uh, a little bit about what they're going to be asked, what you're trying to find out, um, a little bit why you're trying to find that out. Yeah, great. Thanks. So I suppose in terms of what I'm doing, there are three things. I've got this survey, which you've just mentioned. Um, so that has gone out across both North America and the UK. Uh, it's fairly detailed. Um, it's trying to collect really the first, you know, detailed sort of demographic and um you know, uh, sort of survey-based set of data for trail and ultra runners. And I'm using those terms quite vaguely because yeah. what we want to do is explore those terms and maybe we can come back to that. Um, so that will collect a lot of information about who runners are, you know, about what they think, about what they do, um, you know, about levels of education, about the type of running they do, their income, all kinds of things, uh, ethnicity, you know, gender. Um, so there's a survey. I'm following that up with detailed interviews with both runners, um, sort of everyday runners, and those working in the profession, um, you know, from race directors through to athletes through to podcasters. Um, so, you know, you know, have this kind of wide set of interview data as well, collecting stories. Um, and I'm also doing some archival research as well around the history of trail and ultra running. And that's one of the things I'm working on writing about at the moment, actually. Um, and there are going to be kind of broadly three parts to the, the the project as it comes out. The main output will be a book, and I'm going to bring together the history of running trail and ultra running from the 19th century onwards, um, sort of Victorian pedestrianism through yeah. to the early races. <laughs> the they were enormous, weren't they? They were a big spectator sport, the early Victorian races. It was, yeah. I mean, most people don't know much about this at all. It's like a hidden history. Um, yeah. But Victorian pedestrianism was the first modern sport. And they were huge. I mean, that you know, 50,000 people going to watch someone yeah. run around a track. They like yeah. that. Red was reading something about them and they tried to keep him awake and they were like shaking him and sticking needles in him. And yeah. stuff. <laughs> they did all kinds of really, really peculiar things. It was really interesting. Yeah. So you had a six day race because they couldn't run on the seventh day because it was a day of rest in Christian Britain, right? Um, so a lot of the early ultra running records were set during this time, but I mean, you know, much further than that, much further than six days, you know, talking about sort of 2000, 3000 mile runs, um, really quite incredible feats. Um, and it was surrounded by gambling. There was loads of gambling. It was all about betting and money and, um, all sponsored by the ale houses, you know, all these inns, which were paid <coughs> athletes to come so they could sell booze. Yeah. Um, and lots of shenanigans as well, you know, sort of people being hired to go and beat people up, beat runners up to stop them doing what they were doing. And, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's, a movie here. there's a movie here for sure. <laughs> I wonder what the turn of events was, because it, it sounds proper like rock and roll. And um, but then obviously this like even running today really isn't watched um, like that, apart from maybe like a world championship or an, or an Olympics. I wonder what the timeline for, for the kind of people turning away from athletics like that is. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I, I can kind of tell you really in some ways, it was towards the end of the 19th century and it was because the sport had become seen as uh, a bit shady, a bit dodgy. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, people weren't sure anymore about putting money down on some of these races. Yeah. um because they were all fixed uh well they weren't all fixed but some of them were they could be yeah. um and and but it was because uh you know in britain it was football and cricket started to become very popular and yeah. in the us it was baseball so they were replaced by other spectator sports um it didn't and... take six days you could sort of yeah <laughs> yeah no, that's right let's go so... watch someone for 90 minutes or six days yeah <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I want to trace that history. I want to bring, because that's actually been written about quite a lot. Um, and there's been bits on fell running. You might have read some of Steve Chilton's books on the history of fell running. There's nothing really about the history of trail running in the US, for example. There are yeah. some websites and community projects out there. But I want to trace that history through and bring and really connect all of those, connect the dots from pedestrianism through to fell running, you know, looking at the early history of the Taramahara, for example, in Mexico. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm looking at an amazing race there in 1867, 100 miles, eight women, um, one of whom had given birth 10 days before. She yeah. Bandaged, yes. yeah, yeah. She bandaged her breasts because she, you know, she'd just given birth. She was nursing her child and, you know, was presumably a bit sore and swollen, but she went and ran 100 Completely miles. sore and swollen. Oh, <laughs> she won the race, Eddie, you'll be pleased to hear. Oh. <laughs> no. yeah i want to trace all of this history through right through to the establishment of the big trails like the pennine way the yeah. pacific crest trail the appalachian trail which were being done in the uk and north america at the same time through to the birth of amateur trail running and fell running in the 1960s and 1970s to the present day so there's a really long history that hasn't been brought together before and I'm doing a lot of the archival research around that and really trying to um, preserve some of it. Well, make it make it more um, uh, available for everybody, for both yeah. American readers and for British readers, so we can learn about one another's different heritage and we can see the parallels there and the connections as well. Um, so that's the first part of it, the history side. Um, then I want to look at the modern sport of trail and ultra running. I want to ask the question, what are we talking about when we use those terms? So, but they're both American terms. I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, but they're becoming more and more popular in the UK. Um, some people don't like that and they're resistant yeah, to it. It used to be off-road, wasn't it? It'd be off-road running or cross-country mm. running. Trail is for deafening the sort of last five years, isn't it? Trail. Yeah. yeah. I, I prefer the, the more neutral term I use is off-road endurance running because that just is a makes yeah. us sound more hardcore doesn't it Obviously. yeah but it's, it's not a snappy and it doesn't make sense to well it does make sense to american sort of you know runners but trail and ultra running has kind of cachet on both sides of the, the atlantic i guess yeah yeah um so exploring what we mean by that and the way in which the sport is growing and looking at some of the institutions around the sport so you know um we can think about some of the different governing bodies you know the, like the american trail running association for example but then we can think about private enterprises as well so utmb um you know is becoming a dominant presence in the sport isn't it really for, yeah. you know for better or worse and i know people have got quite strong views about that um so i'm just trying to tap into some of that and think about that scene at the moment about what's happening and how the sport is becoming established because mm -hmm. you know with other sports what you find is that in those early years they they do become established and it's hard to undo some of the structures that get put into place so that it needs yeah. a bit of thought now a huge rapid growth as well rapid growth is actually never really good is it because things are quickly put in place with no backup and po potentially no reason as well and then it's very hard to change mm. i mean i mean utmb is obviously fast becoming the I suppose the kind of world series set of races you know the kind of the world cup of trail and ultra running isn't it really right like self-proclaimed though isn't it <laughs> it yeah, is yeah. self-proclaimed but then at the same time all the elite athletes want to race in utmb and they see it as the pinnacle of their running career don't they if they can win that race and you know do well in it you know you've got jim walmsley he's moved to france so that he can <laughs> he can hopefully win utmb this year that's his plan still won't happen still won't happen <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, Killian's on the start line, isn't it? It's just if Killian's on the start line, unless he gets stunned by a what? By a beer, I was going to say, needs oh, to yes. with the bees, yeah. <laughs> but it's not going to happen. Um, sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, keep going. 
Yeah, so so that's the second part of the project to look at um, to look at some of those institutions, but also to look at some of the issues in 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 trail and ultra running, some of the issues around diversity. So if we think about uh, the background that runners come from, it is still very much a privileged sport in some ways. Um, you know, the barriers to access for ultra running can be quite high in some respects. I think it isn't cheap always, um, and it's a very it's a very white sport as well. Um, you know, people from a non-white background aren't very well represented in this sport. Um, there's lots of really good work that's being done on that, you know, like black trail runners in the UK, for example. Um, but just to try and engage with some of that conversation and, you know, again, with a fast growing sport, we need to ask why it's not growing so fast in certain parts of our yes. society. Um, issues around gender, really interesting, and sexuality, you know, um, you know, if we, I mean, this, this is a problem. This is an issue for many competitive sports. But if we think about, you know, transgender athletes, non-binary athletes, I mean, we still have a, a men's race and a, and a women's race, you know, in pretty much all races. Yeah. Um, those are only just being grappled with, with really. Um, so to try and explore some of those conversations and to, I don't know, to, I suppose, help bring a lot of the work that which is being done out there already to the fore and to put it into some kind of accessible form for for everyday runners to engage with um and then the final bit is the bit i'm personally most interested in which is why do we do it because this is a question i'm always asking myself like we all do every morning <laughs> yeah. Down the stairs. Why? yeah why am i going I struggle with that question run? even today like why 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 do we do it yeah because you know at the end of a race or a long effort you're often miserable sometimes, you know, uh, looking forward to the end. And then five minutes afterwards, you're bucking your next race, you yeah. know, making new plans. <laughs> so <laughs> why, why, why do we like to suffer so much? I don't know. I don't know what the answer is to that. So I wanted to explore that really. Why, why, do, why do people do it? What's the motivation for doing it? Uh, got lots of ideas around that, you know. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons the history of this is quite important is that some of those early runners, people who were going out to the mountains in the Victorian period, they were inspired by the romantics. They wanted to escape the Industrial Revolution, yeah. the kind of mechanised nature of work, all of that. And I don't know, I think there's something to be said for, you know, we've gone through a digital revolution the last 10, 20, 30 years. A lot of work is now in front of a computer. It's quite sedentary. We spend a lot of time in front of screens. I just wonder if there's something there about the general growth in nature-based sports yeah. including trail and ultra running um that can be linked to that are change. you seeing a trend though with your with your answers to the survey are you seeing a trend i don't, I don't know i've not gone through the survey in detail yet there's too much data to, to, yeah. to handle at the moment um i can tell you from the interviews that i've done and the general sense um a lot of the reason people take up ultra running certainly and trail running as well um they do tend to be older it doesn't tend to attract younger people in quite the same way um and there does tend to be a general dissatisfaction with something in their life really they're searching for something right they want adventure they want something and that's that that, that reason for doing that you know that the dissatisfaction that they might have <laughs> whether it's something as mundane as just children around you all the time and <laughs> yeah. wanting something for yourself or or it's something more serious like uh, serious health issues, for example, or, you know, um, uh, sort of maybe sort of alcohol dependency, you know, these kinds of things. Um, that's the thing that helps push somebody out of the door. It seems yeah. often to be the case, not always, but often. Yeah. I do think about that sometimes when some people maybe replace an addiction with exercise, I just worry sometimes what do they do when they can't exercise um they kind of oh yeah what, what happens then so yeah it's super interesting well we're just grumpy aren't we <laughs> yeah very grumpy that is true <laughs> i think i think maybe dissatisfaction is a word that it's it's um speaking from somebody who i often find the why of why i do this quite hard to answer and often it's not and it and i think a lot of people will recognize this it's not actually the running and the actual being out there i love that i love being out but it's actually what it gives to me that i take back into the rest of my life that we are missing from our life and it's not that i'm dissatisfied with my life i love my life but it's that um that life is hard and as and not hard physically as such now and I sort of I search that out 
I want that physical hardship almost because I almost feel like we're given so much now and life is too easy to click and you get that instant satisfaction from you know <clears throat> buying something or yeah. you know connecting with someone is so easy but actually going out on the trails and going you can't recreate it sometimes I remember uh it was Sarah Perry's Bob Graham round the weather that we had to endure on leg four was horrendous but I absolutely loved it it was and I remember just saying to my friend Neil this I just this is exactly where I want to be um but <laughs> it was horrible but you just can't recreate that in in in, in regular yeah. life I wonder <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but that's one of the ironies, isn't it, really? I mean, dissatisfaction, we can be dissatisfied with happiness, can't we? That we can feel too cosseted and um, yeah, yeah. But, you, but you want that adventure. I mean, adventure is uncertainty, right? We Many of us live in far more certain and stable environments than you might have done 100 years, 200 years ago. But, yeah. um, you know, adventure is uncertainty, it's difficulty, it's challenge. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that's a big driver of it, surely. Um, yeah, but it's really, this is what I want to do. I want to collect these stories because we all have our own ideas about what it is that drives us out there. And I'm, I'm just intrigued. And I think other people are about why do other people do it? What is it that gets them out the door training all the time? Because it's hard, isn't it? You know, oh, well, yeah. I'd love to know what the uh, answer is for diversity and more inclusivity with um, genders and, and, and race. I'm a great believer, you know, you... You know, I live in quite a, a poor working class area and um, I do believe that you don't generally, you can't be what you can't see. And that's just mm. quite a large sweeping statement. And I think it's super important, but I really don't know what the answer is to. I see it. I'm super privileged. I'm a white middle aged man. Um, I, but, but I would love to see more people of colour, more women on the start line. But I, honestly, I don't, I don't know. You know, I've chatted with my wife about this quite a lot, and I, we don't know what the answer is. Why, why I feel compelled to just enter everything I see, <laughs> and she, is it guilt? I don't know what it is. Guilt leaving the home. Um, I don't know what it is. But yeah, I'd love to know what the answer is to that. Yeah. So, I'm starting to get some ideas about this, really, because one of the things I ask is the kind of origin story of where runners have come from and how they got into the sport and how they started running ultra sort of distances in particular. Um, and I was a little bit, I suppose, a little bit surprised by it, really, in some ways. Most people do it because of um, some kind of a personal connection to somebody who already does it. Um, so maybe someone from your running club, somebody you know, you see that they've done it, that they've yeah. run a race like that. And you think, oh, maybe I could do it. Or maybe you're invited to do one, you know, come on, my friend, come on, let's go and do this race. It's, you know, 50K yeah. or whatever. So there's a sort of personal connection there that that gets somebody uh, it gets their foot in the door, right? Um, and I mean, research has shown that actually, sort of access to the outdoors, you know, to the Lake District, all that kind of thing, um, has has predominantly been, you know, uh, a kind of white a form of white privilege in some respects. It's not something that non-white communities often, which have been more urban based, have had, a, you know, a tradition in or access to. So there just isn't this culture and there aren't those personal connections there. Um, and I think the reason that there is, you know, a big growth in the sport, but it isn't to date in non-white communities, is that there aren't those, it just doesn't exist there in, in the same yeah. way. So the kind of work that black trail runners are doing, I think, is really the answer to it. It's yeah. about trying to grow it. It's about trying to get that sort of, you know, that hub, that nucleus of, of non-white runners who then can help you know kind of ex expose others to the sport really and to bring, yeah. to bring them into the fold um, yeah it's super important i think to see i, I just walk in the dog with my wife where i live is pretty football dominant um and they had a little athletics track painted on the field nobody's on the athletics track eddie <laughs> everybody playing football and i'm thinking well that's why where's the next generation they can't see anybody running around this track it just seems so it's super important like you say the black trail runners uh it's people to be seen and with the younger people, I think it's about inspiring them. Um, I, I saw a really interesting thing. So um, I was at a race a couple of years ago in the Lake District, and we were getting changed in the school. It was starting at school. We were getting changed in their, um, you know, sports hall or whatever. And, um, you know, I was looking at the uh, the board, the bulletin board, you know, like you get in. Yeah, I love that. I yeah. love a board today at a school, and I can read all the notice boards. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, straight on it, you know, like looking at what they had. And actually, um, you it was in the late district, you would expect them to be promoting kind of fell running and, you know, the kind of grizzly old men in vests, that kind of traditional, right? The traditional picture you have of cross country and fell running. That's, that's yeah. kind of what I thought of it when I was growing up. Um, but it was actually they had this big poster of Anton Kropitscher, the you know the American runner, oh. <laughs> look, <laughs> looking very. Um, I don't know, yeah, I, I was going to say sexy. I don't know if that's the right word. Maybe, but you know, like I don't, flesh, but, isn't it, Anton? He likes yeah. his top off. Oh yeah, yeah. He he doesn't wear many clothes, does he? <laughs> <laughs> But I thought, you know, oh, I don't know, maybe that's the answer, you know, that kind of to glamorize the sport in some ways to so that it's not running around in a soggy vest in the rain, like we've probably spent most of our time doing, but to to give it that sort of sexy, slightly Americanized appeal. I don't know, you know, maybe there's a there's something there for younger people. Yeah. <laughs> something there for Gary, he's like poster of Anton on my wall. <laughs> Um, so we talked a little bit about the project. How can people get involved in this project? Everything we could talk to you forever about all the different streams and um, threads that you're going to. There's so much you can you're going to pull all together. It's such a load amount of data. I think you are going to need to uh, employ that research assistant. To <laughs> How can people? Most people will be listening to this probably on a run, but when they go home, what can they click on to find the project? How can they get involved? Yeah. So thank you. So we've got we've got a project website, and it's really really easy it's uh, trailultraproject.com um so i mean you can google it or just put it straight into your internet browser that'll take you to the website there's there are some resources on there there's a lot of information about the project uh, that people can take a look at but the main thing is that we have a survey which should be open now for uh, two or three months um and if you could go and spend 10 minutes of your time filling in the survey that would be absolutely fantastic fantastic um uh, so that's it, really. I think and, <laughs> I did the survey. Overall, it's quite painless. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, Gary can do it. Anyone can do it. And overall, what is your sort of like aim of the of the whole project? What are you going to do with the data? I know you talked about a book. Is it also like education? You're going to be like, do you? Do, I'm grasping at straws here, but do you like sell it to people who are interested in like sponsor how they do how like you just talked about like how we do. Uh, market trail running how they market races is that sort of um where you're going to be going with some of the data as well yeah so so definitely the book is going to be the main output um and that should be coming out maybe towards the end of next year um and that's by the way that's going to be written not for academics it's going to be written for runners so in gary <laughs> Nice pictures. Academics tend to go down rabbit holes and get tied up in all kinds of, I don't know, you know, overly indices and yeah, yeah. So um, I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to make something which is authoritative and get you know detailed but engaging, so that we can all enjoy it. A reason, like this, is what we found, and then a good story as to like you started telling us about the sort of Victorian running as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there'll be a book, but then I'm hopefully because because there is very little research out there on this, and you can't generate research funding for other projects and for you know some kind of what we call impact work, working with organisations on specific issues. You can't generate that funding without research justification and because there's no research there's no justification so around some of these areas around gender around diversity you know whether that's class-based diversity ethnic diversity whatever um it would be really really good to work with some running organizations maybe some races or whatever to do some work around those issues to get some funding to actually you know address some of these real world problems i mean i don't want to paint a negative picture of the sport because it's fantastic and it's growing and you know it's full of wonderful people but i guess there are some challenges and it would be great to to do some work around those in the future yeah and then also to feed it in i guess other people as well and say here's my you take this part of the project this is what i found this is what you could then do some either more research on it or this is this is where the sport needs work because we're all big fans of the sport but it it has no support structure you know it has no grassroots as you say like at the school it's got no grassroots participation it it's sort of started a coaching uk athletics have started sort of run leader coaching but really there's no like formal coaching qualifications there's no formal system that people are interested that they can sort of feed through so all that sort of research that you're doing not directly linked but actually indirectly would be a huge what an a, enormous castle of work you would come you're going to come I think out it's with great it. <clears throat> mm, i hope so yeah <laughs> so check out yeah trail ultra listeners go over there and 
do the survey. It's awesome. And um, yeah, where you're we at, you look forward to the book. We, we're expecting a signed copy now, aren't we, Gary? Yeah. Uh, well, you're going to need to read it out for Gary. You're going to need to read the audio version. Need the Kindle oh, version. Yeah. Fine <laughs> for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So where, where you're at, you vote. You want about a thousand questionnaires filled in. A thousand was a, a decent sort of credible target really a bit of a stretch target actually so really pleased to be well on my way to that we'll smash that after friday <laughs> uh, you know get our families on it we'll be there we'll be there yeah. <laughs> awesome should we move on to the quick five let's do it let's do it okay i've got six again idiot i've always struggled to mm -hmm. count my, yeah. Uh... yeah um yeah maybe oh yeah that's a good one or oh, maybe number six Get rid of that. We'll one. see how we go. We'll see how we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, Carl, you are just about to go for a super duper long trail run. Are you listening to a podcast, music, or just the sound of the sheep and the trickling water in your feet pitter pattering on the trails? Oh, we're super yeah, you're long. Us each week. What? <laughs> a super long run. Yeah, I don't listen to anything on a super long run. Um, oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. If you're going to enter a race, typically would you go for maybe like a defined route event, like say the Lakeland 100, or would it be a hardcore point-to-point -point fastest route fell race? Ooh, uh, well, I like long things, really. I like I like fell races. I like, you know, um, choose your own route kind of thing. But at the same time, they don't tend to be as long as I like. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, kinda, I, I guess a marked, a marked long lakeland 100 style race yeah okay i suppose this kind of answered question three but i'll go for it anyway if you could only do one and get the medal or the certificate at the end would it be a successful utmb or a sober 24 hour bob graham round utmb i think um Oh, I thought he was going to say Bob Graham. Oh, but yeah, the Lake District is on my doorstep. <laughs> Running the Alps, UTMB, yeah. hard to get into. So, yeah. <laughs> you I, feel, I, I feel awful saying that now, actually. I feel like I've somehow kind of <laughs> <laughs> let the side down. I don't know. Yeah. It is a bit yeah, mesmerizing, the UTMB. We so this podcast, we don't judge. <laughs> yeah, not It's a big money making company over your solo. Oh, look, you've triggered Eddie now. <laughs> <laughs> um would it be you're going to read a book but would you would it be kindle a book or a traditional book sorry or an audiobook oh uh, i can't get into audiobooks at all i do find them difficult i don't know why um a traditional book i've got a kindle but yeah i like paper i like the smell of paper spilling coffee on it all that kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> you're signing up to your next race and you get to the box where it says do you want a t-shirt or do you want to plant a tree Teas or trees? What do you go for? Oh yeah, plant a tree. Yeah, awesome. I've had to hand t-shirts back. They've tried to force them on me sometimes. And uh, yeah. I yeah. listen to um, oh my goodness, I've blanked on the name. The Ultra Trail Ultra Running podcast with Dan and James, and he was saying like event organisers almost think they're doing him a favour by handing him like five hundred unused t-shirts, and he's like, no, 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 don't produce the t-shirts it's very mm. it's very simple um i think you've answered again this one already but uh yeah miles with friends or a solo run losing yourself on the trails solo run yeah both are good but yeah by myself out there for a long time is is better <laughs> so both tick the box. I love that. by yourself out there <laughs> Carl, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm going to remind you again, it's www.trailultraproject.com. Go and fill out the survey, help Carl yeah, out. don't do it. Then you'll know you have a little bit, you've had a little bit of a say in the book that he's going yeah. to Yeah. Um, and also look. potentially shaping how we treat the trails and, and how the sport evolves. I hope so. Yeah, I think so. Thank you so much, Carl. Good luck with the research. Good luck with the book. And go and get that bug going round. Done. No more excuses. <laughs> I will. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Gary, so much. <laughs> Take Bye. care. Thanks. Thank Bye. Thank you so much, Carl, for coming on podcast. Nice to meet you. Uh, we're keeping it local in that street with the uh, with Bob and Carl next. Um, yeah, go and have a look. It's in the show notes. Trail Ultra Project or Google that. Do your survey. He'd be epically grateful and it's a little our little way of giving back isn't it to um all the research that he's going to find out is going to help <clears throat> the race direct all sorts of things um so it just takes what, five minutes if that
I was a bit nervous when we get academics on the show, but they're going to find us out, Barry. <laughs> find us out. Did you made it easy. Go, long division. Long division. Oh, don't ask me any questions. It's, it's quite interesting because I'm moving into the phase of my life now where the kids, you know, they're, they're still really young, but we're sort of discussing like what we're going to do as they get, what we're going to do with our careers and what we're going to do as they get older. And I, I'd really like to do like a master's or something, some sort of study focusing on women, obviously, but something like that. Um, some sort of research. Now the kids are older, I'm finding I've got a little bit more, only a small amount, let's not, <laughs> a small amount of brain power more than I had when they were babies. And I'm like, I, I would quite like to go back in and with all the stuff I've learned and seen and experienced through my running and through my coaching, feel that I would then like to go and put that into like maybe a bit of study. Ooh. Not sure what, it's just a little idea I have. Not sure what yet, not sure where that's going to go, but it's definitely something that I'm quite interested in following. So anybody else doing any interesting studies or projects like that, as long as you're happy to explain it in layman's terms. To me, there, <laughs> <it's Jennifer. laughs> Race, it's coming up. Well, we got the Chevy Chase this weekend, and this is one, I think like I mentioned the previously, but when I was talking about the Swirly Marathon, that, I've always wanted to do the Chevy Chase and never did it because it wasn't technically a marathon. But yeah, 65 years has been going. So this is, you know, very well established race in the UK. And uh, yeah, the route will take you deep into the heart of the land of the far horizon. You will summit both Cheviot and Hedgehope. And yeah, Cheviot's 2,600 feet and Hedgehope is two, three, four, eight. And, you know, you, when you're at the Chiefs, they don't really seem like these massive mountains, but lots of rolling landscape, and that is a pretty... You're tough... not tempted to do that one, Gary? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'd, I'd love to do this race, and yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's just pretty low-key. I think it's like self-navigation. I don't think there's anything, like, you're not going to have your hand held for this one. Just as like an awesome race, and everybody knows who's done it. I just rave about how good it is, so definitely one for the calendar in the future. Uh, and over the other side of the country, down a bit, over the other side, we've got the UTS race series, the sort of, the only, the only UTMB bought out race in England. Am I lying by that? Who, I can't, someone will correct me. Uh, but it's the biggest one. It seems to be, it seems to be the biggest one. Huge, big races. Best of luck if you are tackling any of these three courses. There's a 50 mile option, uh, which is 3,100 meters, 10,200 feet. There's the 100K option, which is 6,600 meters. And then there's the <laughs> there's the 100 mile option, which is 10,200 meters. And um, these are like roughly very similar to OT OTC, CCC, and UTMB. Yeah. Um, but the terrain, I don't think, could be any more different. With the French races uh, around Chamonix, the trails are relatively smooth, um, runnable, very limited. Any scram, not really any scrambling. There'll be a lot of scrambling here. This wow. there is going to be uh, going to the. I mean, I looked at the cutoff for the hundred mile, and it's fifty hours, which is relatively similar to the UTMB cutoff. But you couldn't walk this um, and finish it in fifty hours. I don't think uh, you need some technical skills um, um, for all of them, um, but especially for that long one, they are going to be some hardcore. Just been looking at the entries. Uh, best of luck if you're listening to this, maybe while you're running, or if you're going to tackle those races this weekend. Keep fueling. Keep fueling. Good luck, Carl. Good luck, Carl. Good luck, anybody who listens who's doing those races. We look forward to hearing all about them. What are we doing? What are you doing, Gary? Trying to find your cameras. Yeah, hopefully we're going to have James and Trish on the show, so I need to get all my cameras sorted out for then. I don't want to... I feel really... This is... I, I don't enjoy this as a as an experience to a podcast with my ear, earbuds in. Um, so, yeah, hopefully get everything sorted for that on Wednesday. It's my daughter's birthday on Wednesday too. Sweet 16. My goodness, sweet 16, Eddie. 16. What? Has she got some nice plans? You don't have to share them, obviously, but... Well, I'm going to be around, so if I can time it right, I'd like to go out for lunch with her. That would be nice. Oh, because... The she's broke up now because she's doing yeah, her exams. Yeah, she finished. She finished GCSEs now. Yeah, she had a prom uh, last week. So that was pretty good. Uh, had all her friends sleep over actually. Which I say all her friends. Some of her friends slept over. It was pretty tame. Um, they all slept downstairs. Kind of crashed downstairs. Uh, and I was expecting some carnage in, in in the morning, but no, 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 it was good. They were very well well behaved, all four of them. Um, so that was good. So yeah, hopefully go out for lunch with Esme on Wednesday. Uh, hopefully a trip to the lakes. That's 
being penciled in, but it's all weather dependent. I'm not really I don't want to go over there and get battered when I can just do similar trails or similar elevation, not the same kind of trails. But it's three quarterly sessions this week that I've got on my plan. Probably only do two. I think keep it sensible. Don't want to break anything. And other than that, I think, yeah, I think that's me for the week. What about yourself? Gary, you'll never guess what. I've got two hours left. Two hours left until eldest child finishes for the summer holidays. Oh, 28th yeah. of June until the what? Can you remember that feeling when you'd lost it? Was... I try and remember that feeling and not be grumpy and be like, oh, God, you're going to be here every day now. <laughs> it's my life. Uh, he is for like they'd last forever. Oh, times. Uh, super excited about it. And he's super excited because he gets to finish three days before the other two. So he's going to lord it over them. But, <laughs> um, and he's just finished his first year of like secondary school, which is a big deal, isn't it? When you're kind of like, you've done that step. When he yeah. next goes back, they won't be the youngest. The oldest kids won't be like playing all the pranks on them and all that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. He's ready for his holiday. So that with that becomes uh the juggle, the huge juggle of a job and kids and everything. Um I haven't really got any plans for the next week running wise, just gonna keep running and hoping that nothing else of me swells or falls off. <laughs> Um, we'll just wait <laughs> to see what we're gonna do. Um we're gonna do over the next 10 days. All will be revealed next week when we're recording of where oh, we are. Fingers crossed, Eddie. Fingers crossed you can hear the sound when we next record of the sound of lizards and children playing merrily in a swimming pool and me sipping on a pina colada. Uh, or I might just be here. Anyway, it doesn't matter. As, no. much, as, much, as long as we're all together, that's what it matters. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I hope something comes up. That was episode 96. I hope it was okay. Audio and video. Apologies for my uh, little error this morning. But thanks for listening, everybody. And thank you to Cheer Charge for con continuing to support the show, sending bars to guests, competition winners, keeping Eddie and I fueled in our adventures, and generally being an all-round super supporter to everyone out on the trails. My name's Gary Thwaites. I'm Eddie Sutton. And let's run to the hills. Mm -hmm.